Hey, welcome to Storytime with Ellie Podcast, and I am Ellie. On today's podcast, we're going to be speaking with a gentleman named Larry Rolla. It's a true story of one man's ride through this tainted world of harness racing, horse racing, a world riddled with greed, corruption, celebrity, drugs, sex, and the mob. Today, I want to welcome Larry Rolla. Hey, Larry. <laughs> and Hi, also, folks. and my co-host today is Joseph Santiago. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Everyone wants to talk to Larry. All right, Larry. Fire away. Larry, I, I, you know, this I is a very relaxed podcast. Out. It's going to be, yeah. um, I mean, I've met Larry. I've known Larry since I was like 10 years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um he's friends with my dad and my uncle and he used to race at the racetrack where I worked as a kid. In fact, we were talking about it on an earlier podcast oh. that, um, you know, my family was also with the harness racing and horses and my dad had a transportation and all connected. So I met Larry when I was a child and I knew Larry he was friends with my dad and they would all get together, laugh, lots of fun. And, you know, I didn't know this side of Larry that we're going to talk about today. Okay. I only, you know, about Larry's book. When I read the book, I was like, wow, this is Larry. Okay. Awesome. So, um, yeah. So, all right, Larry, shoot. You can shoot. This is all about you. I want you, I know you, you wrote a book. Possibly you're going to be doing a movie. Lead, lead, lead the way, and we'll jump in with some questions. Absolutely. I'm just fascinated looking at you. The last time I saw you, you were about 10 years old. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That was 20 years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 20 years ago. And it, it, I, it's, it's amazing that I knew your whole family. All your, I knew everybody. Yeah. And um, it's, it's amazing that you were the young, Usually people, especially in Monticello, they're born and raised there. They stay there their whole lives. But in... And you were the only one that just flew away very much. <laughs> like you're, you're like the female version of myself. You, only you know, you stayed in the right lane. I kind of veered off a little. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. You're funny, Larry. It's, well, it's a good comparison. But anyway, <laughs> we actually spoke a few times and we were on the phone. The first time I spoke with Larry was a few weeks ago when I invited him on this podcast because I said, oh, my God, when I saw the book, right, he's, re he's right. released this book. He's going to be you know, he's doing a movie. Right. And when I see them, I'm like, oh my God, you know, it's like, I haven't spoken to him since, like he said, since I was a kid. And uh, it was great. We caught up, I think hours. We were on the phone probably several hours just talking about. How did, how did that work out? How did you everything. reconnect? Uh, well, he's on my uh, social media. Oh, okay. Because he, you know, he doesn't live any, in the area anymore where I'm, where I'm from. Right, right. You know, he's in New Jersey. Okay. So he's on my social yeah. media. And when I saw he released this book, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what, you know. What happened to Larry? This, so this yeah, this is what happened to Larry. Larry has a story. Larry's got the story, but uh, yeah. So this was great. I was great to. It's static that he was able to come on the podcast and talk a little bit about um, his book and his ventures and a little bit about his you know life. He's also doing his own podcast as well. He recorded several, which is a series. Mm -hmm. I did get to see one of them about the races and all that, which I was was very very interesting. Yeah, some yeah. of the stories that he said on there. Yeah, I um. So, Larry, let, I'm going to let you start. Um, I know we ask a question, but what do you, we got you on here, and I want you to, ex, you know, explain a little bit to our audience, um, a little bit about you. You right, you were into the heart. Let's back it up. What got you into say racing? Because that's how I knew you. You were, you know, harness. You were a driver, a fantastic driver, and that's how I knew of you. Now. Um, what led you to get get into that business of uh, harness racing? Oh, be, be, before I go into that, I just want to say that um, I, I I know before you were even born, I knew I knew your mother and father, and um, and and in your relatives, and through the years, my years in Monticello, um, you have some sisters that I I could never, and and the same thing goes with everybody in Monticello. 
one was more beautiful than the other, and it depends where you started at. It was just <laughs> this unbelievable family. Uh, and, and just so you. you know, I'll tell you something about your father that you don't know. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Okay. When I when I was really hitting the skids, really real bad. Your father was the one that no matter how far away I was, whatever what red track what racetrack I was at, he came with his twelve horse van, oh, horse van, mm -hmm. and shipped me and took me any place I wanted to go. And instead of giving me a bill, he slipped a couple of hundred dollars into my pocket every time. Oh, he was wow. an amazing. He was an amazing guy oh, along God. with your uncle, his brother Joe. Make me want to cry. Yeah. Joe always rode with with, uh, with with your father. They were just an amazing, on. amazing guy, um, and and gone much too soon, as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I drove up there a few years back just to say hello to them, and we had lunch in one of the diners up there with uh, your father and your uncle and and uh, and the kid Joe Joey Joe Stiesemann Jr. and uh, it was. Um, it, it was probably it was the last time I I, I saw them. Um, I just wanted you to know you come from great people and uh, and it amazes me that the last <laughs> last time I saw you a little kid a little brat and now you're <laughs> grown into a, somebody that I'm looking nope. at I, I can't believe it with this long blonde wavy hair beautiful face oh um, wait. And, 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 look at you, well bro. thank you you must know I came on here today complaining about that. <laughs> But oh, Larry, thank you so much, and the, and the compliments of my dad and uncle, very emotional because they, I mean, it's not about this process, it's not about them, but they were two men that were just incredible, and uh, and they were well, somebody the best. Got to speak about them because they they basically yeah. they I wasn't the only one that they helped up there. They, the Monticello, as you know, uh, the purses were small. Almost everybody up there, half of them lived in attack rooms and, and raised yeah. their kids in attack rooms. And and uh, they were always, everybody was always broke. And, and your father was the one that um, everybody knew that they can go to him. And, and a lot, many times they would sit in the track kitchen waiting for your father to come in with <laughs> And uh, just ask him for ten or twenty bucks, and he never turned anybody down. He no. was just—he was just a good—he was a good guy. Thank you. And uh, and and he and all the kids he raised all you kids great, all good responsible kids, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, thank you, Larry. And and oh, okay, that um, now I'll I'll get into how to answer your question. I, I when I was a kid, um, long probably in the 50s, uh, I was I always wanted to race cars, uh, and I did, and and that's how I uh, that's how I eventually went blind welding, w building a car um, without the uh, mask on because the rods were wet, and every time I pulled the mask down, I'd lose the spark. And anyway, I went from I I was racing. By the time I was 14, I was racing stock cars at Freeport and. Uh, I, I built dragsters and roadsters in, and I raced them at the drag strip at, at uh, in Long Island, wow. in West wow. Hampton. And um, and the, the, the problem was, I, I loved it and that's what I wanted to do. The problem was whenever I blow an engine or a clutch or something, I had no money. Uh, my family had no money. And uh, I, I, I used to jump junkyard fences and, and trying to rob parts and everything. and go steal things just to, and, and it was just, it was just tough to keep up, wow. but I wanted a race every Friday and every Sunday. Yeah. And one day I, um, a horse van pulled in the gas station where I was working at on my cars. And, um, it was a horse van. Uh, Mike Foley was driving and had three horses in the back. He asked me for a bucket of water. And I found out then that you could raise horses for money and mm -hmm. instead of trophies and blankets, which I had a, a, a room full of trophies and blankets, but n no money, and 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 going out stealing every day just to support that ha that habit. So uh, he invited me out to the farm. I went out to the farm. Make a long story short, through, through uh, took about a year and a half. I wound up getting my my license to drive and to train, and and that's what started it. And then. Um, uh, I got in a little bit of trouble for no, it wasn't my fault. And 
It really wasn't. I mean, it, I did a lot of bad things, but the, 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 when I got barred from Yonkers Racetrack, um, it was not in 1965. It was not my fault. And uh, Tannenbaum on the track just barred me because he thought I stiffed the horse, finished back on purpose, and and mm -hmm. I and I and um, uh, he barred me, and and that. Um, and that forced me to go to all the smaller tracks all around the country and, and, and you know, uh, my, my diet there. In fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the, probably one of the best meals I had was when we caught a bunch of pigeons and, and, and cooked them. Oh, my it was goodness. was very, very, very tough. Yeah. And uh, I'll just inject your father. Every once in a while when I had to move from track to track, your father – that was the phone call I made, and he came and got me through a couple of hundred dollars, and and never, oh, wow. never once, even through the years, even, even when I start doing well at Monticello in the in the in the late seventies and eighties, I I try to pay him back. He just he just wouldn't take it. He was just he was just a special guy, and he just 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 Thank a you. good just a good guy. Yeah. So uh, that's what got me. That's what got me into the horse racing, and uh, because I developed a terrible, terrible addiction to sports betting, uh, by nineteen, probably nineteen seventy-one, I had lost over a million dollars betting on oh. sports. What? And I wind yeah. up uh, owing uh, two different bookmakers, uh, one from up there, Monticello, and one from uh, New Jersey. I owed them close to eight hundred thousand dollars between the wow. two of them, and yeah. uh, and it put me on um, it put me in a survival mode where I had to do what I had to do to to, to stay alive. Because back then in the seventies, when you deal with them kind of people, you know you get if you do what I did, normally you get dead. But they knew I was in a position uh, where um, I could earn. I could earn big. And um, and for a year a year and a half I, I paid all the time I like I said I paid I lost over a million dollars and always paid every wow. Tuesday and uh, it was um, it was a, it was it was a tough life and if it wasn't I have to say this if it wasn't for Charles Slotsky who owned Monticello Raceway uh, that let me get away with a lot a lot uh, and. And because of my friendship with him, uh, the racing commission and the judges that were there knew of our friendship, and they kind of looked the other way many times. But I did what I had to do, uh, and 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 because of the life that I led, uh, um, and the fact that I wound up paying this, uh, because they made that money when I couldn't pay, they even made that money a Shylock loan. So they basically. Um, I owed close to seven hundred thousand dollars for two points. So every week, I was paying seventy-two hundred dollars a week in VIG. Uh, so um, uh, for each for each of them. So every every week, I had to come up with VIG is interest on the money when you're dealing with people uh, like the, the mob. Right. And um, so uh, two points a week for for. Uh, it came to six, almost close to sixteen thousand dollars. I had to make, wow. and uh, and it, it was either make it or, or wind up uh, dead. Wow. Right. And that's, that, and, that's, uh, that's what they did back then. Early. So anyway, um, I I lived through all of that. I won't go go through all of it. A lot of it is in the book, and a lot of them is going to a lot of it is going to be explained in the podcast that I was convinced to 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 to. to uh, produced uh and in fact years ago i think it was in 2018 uh frank colada who i had some dealings with right around 1974 when i was in a lot of trouble and frank colada for those of you who don't know frank colada was uh the button guy for uh frank uh, um, spilatro uh, frank colada was the button guy for spilatro tony spilatro in las vegas if you saw the movie Casino, that's what they Pesci played the part of Tony Spilatro and, uh, and Frank Frank oh, okay. played himself in the movie, okay. and he did me a, a, a big favor. We did a few things in 1974. And when he wrote a book, he put that a chapter in his book 
and he explained um, it, he explained what what we did and how we did it together uh, that saved my life. And uh, he put that chapter in his book and and he called me one day and he said, you know, I have this book out and I'm on all these podcasts. Um, this was around 19, uh, 2018. And he said, of all the chapters in my book, I get asked more about the chapter that, that we did, that you're in than any other chapter. So he says to me, why don't you write a book about your life story? Because he knew what I went through. So I mentioned it to a couple of guys that I grew up with around here. Um, and one of them was Frank Vincent, the actor. Um, and um, he says, yeah, write, write, write a book, uh, self-publish it, and uh, and I'll get it to somebody. So, um, so naturally, I didn't, I had no idea how to do it, but they walked me through it, and I did self-publish it, and I had, I had, uh, I think the only place you can get it, they wanted me to put it in Barnes and Noble and all of that stuff, and go for signings, and, and I didn't want that. I said all I want is one copy of the book, and send it to California. But anyway, it's on, it's on, I think you can buy it on Amazon. It sold thousands and thousands of copies. Uh, I guess all that. And, uh, that's the uh, book that he wrote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that, Larry, so Larry, I, Larry, I have a question for you because I know yeah. we're, we, you're, we're moving on. Yeah, um, and, and Larry's got so much to say, and yeah. I got a bunch of questions too. But yeah. So shoot. I wanted to, I wanted to like go back to the first part of what you said because Richie, I didn't know this when I watched this podcast about your passion was with cars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, I didn't say, I didn't say anything about the cars. So my question to you, real quick, is: so you went from cars, and then the the incident when you found out you could make money with horses. So I think myself and everybody else like what was your passion what was your why what made you go from cars to quickly flip into the racing and would you say was it the love of money the addiction you said you have with sports betting or was it the actual horses because in your podcast you mentioned that people that were there training the horses and and were riding them that they were broke they just did it for the love and the passion of it so how can you portray what would you say was your story when it came to that part of of your of your life well my passion was going fast and competing <laughs> that, i was saying was adrenaline junkie i think he was an adrenaline junkie okay so yeah, that's yeah. I'm, I'm answering your question for him yeah. no that's good i was just <laughs> curious on that yeah my passion was going fast and competing mm -hmm. okay. my my uh the the, necess the necessity the love was um the money i, okay. I mean okay if, if you're not born into wealth or have have a have money so have scary. access to money uh you know you you can you can only go so far and right. and i didn't care what i raced i mean i didn't care if i raced skates or motor scooters or ice skating and giraffes no or anything you there like. it is. so whatever whatever you can raise okay. whatever you can make money on that makes sense yeah. okay. whatever so you can make money combination and the reason i switched the horses was only because of uh the money that you race for purse money and if, glamorous if, if it was glamorous money, i would have stayed with the cars but once gotcha. i went with the horses i fell in love you know it's a whole lot you know you can't fall in love with a fender of a car <laughs> right. with a horse yeah and that's They're what beautiful. i did my love for animals grew immensely and um and all i wanted to do is is take care of them and uh and so so that's that's where that's where okay. i stayed and I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna jump through this Larry like you said we're gonna hear we're just gonna be chatting away with you as well but you mentioned your love for the horses and taking care of them what did you do you developed some kind of um product I'll try to look through my notes that you were able to basically medicate well how did you something with I'm looking through my notes help me out you don't have to look I think I know what you're talking yeah, about yeah I read something well, that was, that, that, was that, later, that, that was later on uh when it, this was in in the in the 80s when everybody thought uh when the metal lands first opened in 74 75 76 uh all the top trainers and top horses come there the purse money was was astronomical it was very good purse money and everybody like everybody in life and 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 any job in any area is looking for an edge and they found the edge in drugs 
and and when the state came up with tests that could that could identify the drugs, uh, they went out of the country to find drugs that did the same job that were not detectable here because they didn't have a uh, test for it. So okay. it became it became a a drug war, and it created a a very uneven and unfair playing field for all the trainers and drivers that were 100% honest. And, and, and then in order to compete, um, you, you had to, you had to do what they did. You had to, you had to, you know, you just had to, if you're going to, if you aren't going to compete, you might as well get out of business. Right. So everybody knew what everybody was doing. And the, and the guys with the wealthy owners and big stables, they were able to afford these kind of drugs and, and the main one that they they started with um, was, and the one that did the most damage was uh, epigen, and and that's a that's a drug that just creates blood cells, and uh, and more the more blood cells you have, the more oxygen you have, and then the f- further you can go. Right. Uh, so when I finally got my license back, um, and and I got to that point where I was re- uh, racing at the Meadowlands, I realized all of this. The problem I had was that I didn't I didn't want to do that because there was many, many side effects for the mm. horse. If you didn't monitor the epigen, uh, it could turn into, uh, you, you, the horse's blood could turn into glue. And, and oh, wow. many oh, horses okay. died. And, and, and that goes for many of the, 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 the drugs that, these trainers uh, got from other countries. They didn't know the right dosage, and and I can tell you, hundreds of horses died. I won't get into that because it's it's gory. But um, oh, by the time they found out the right dosage, uh, they killed hundreds of horses. But that was the game. That 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 was it. I, I mean, even even uh, even today, like Baffert, a leading thoroughbred trainer in in the whole world. Seventy-five horses in his care died of heart attacks. That, I mean, what? I've been uh, in the business yeah, so this years. is. I don't know of seven, seventy-five horses that died of heart attacks in in my whole experience. So, but anyway, um, so what? What I what I was I, I was thinking of seriously uh, of getting out of the business because I really couldn't c- compete, and I didn't know how to. To, to make a level level playing field so I could compete and 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 quite honestly by feeding just hay and oats what you're allowed to do um uh, I was finishing up the racetrack and 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 I knew what they were doing and naturally I wasn't going to go to the commission and naturally I wasn't going to do that and, and, and abuse the horses in my care right. so was, yeah I yes. what I did was I I did a little research and I found out, and I think it was the 1965 Olympics, I found out that um, all the winners of the Olympics that year came from high altitudes. And then I investigated high altitudes and I found out that altitudes 5, 10, 15,000 feet above sea level, um, where the air is a lot less, your body uh, adjusts and uh, the spleen uh, creates. Uh, maybe 30 percent more red blood cells so you could so that it makes up for the lack of oxygen and and um and that's basically what epigen does only with no side effects yeah. so what i did was i created a friend of mine and myself he was an engineer we designed and created an uh a, a epoxic stall epoxic is uh is lack of oxygen Mm. And uh, we created that stall. And during that time, I had four or five horses that while we were experimenting with it, uh, I housed them in the, in this stall. Um, and uh, when I raced each one of them, they, they all won. Wow. And then, and then uh, I decided to try <laughs> to turn this into a... a uh a, a bit a business so we built maybe 30 or 40 of them and i went down to fair hill in, in maryland the big thoroughbred thing and i had i gave it a whole seminar down there what it does and everything and in the meantime um i forgot his name but there was a third a standard bread trainer here i can't think of his name and he had a horse called broadband i think and it was about 10 years ago i guess it was 
and he was um, he was eligible for the Hamiltonian, which is the biggest trot mm-hmm. race that Standard Bread uh, uh, has, and it was a million dollar race or a million and a half dollar race, and um, and and there's uh, the, he raced against through the year through that year he raced against the same eight or ten horses every week and could never beat them, but he was owned by a guy who used to build who builds these uh, uh, nuclear plants and very wealthy guy Mm. and he lived out where my where we built the hyperbaric chambers and and he came to the farm one day and he says he'd like to buy so Don my partner sold him against my wishes sold him uh, one of the stalls Mm. and uh, he brought it to his farm hooked it all up and everything and he housed the horse in there and uh, the horse had three races to go before the Hamiltonian against horses he, he he could never finish better than fifth against. And uh, his first race out of the stall, he won. Wow, he won okay. his next race, he won his next race, he won the next race, and then uh, he won the Hamiltonian. And um, and at that point, um, we got orders from from the, the Saudi Arabia, they wanted a thousand of these things, and they wanted more to race their camels and everything. But anyway, oh I won't get into all of that. Camels. So, so I, I, that I, I, that, that's, that's the one thing that I think that I, I created that, that would create a level playing field. The only problem was if you had horses stable at the racetrack, this was a mobile stall. It was a, it was a 10 by 12 stall uh attached to another five by ten uh where all the um the compressors and everything were and uh the racetrack wouldn't let you have it and keep wouldn't let you put it on on their property and um so uh, anyway so, that, so that, that's that so that answers your question that's the yeah, one yeah. thing that i created that that um that, that Wait, level wow of that's all i can say larry is wow um so with that I mean, that's amazing. It is. Um, now, obviously, did they consider that fixing races? Well, they couldn't what? because if they ever, there was, medical- no, there was no drug involved, there was nothing. And if they ever barred that, they would have to scratch every horse that chipped in from an al- altitude higher than uh, sea level. And the same thing goes with fighters. And, and the, why do you think a lot of the boxes yeah. come up from Monticello to... to, to to uh, get ready for a fight. We did. We had a lot up there training uh, fighters. I didn't know. Think, why do you think all these people from high altitudes win all these long distance races? And uh, it's just a fact. It's knowledge. Just a fact. A lot of knowledge Nobody ever that. did it uh, and, and until I did it. Um, now they're coming out with all these masks and everything that don't work anyway. But anyway. So you were ahead of your time there? Yeah, he was. Wow. So- Come on, let's get some more questions. I yeah. can't pull them up on my phone. Oh, so I was going to say, because it's talking about how you've evolved and creating your own, you know, way to have an even playing field. So kind of like I, I never, I personally um, been to maybe one or two horse races and I didn't know after seeing your podcast and listening to you now, I didn't know there was so much stuff behind the scenes that happened. And, you know, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was like, how has the horsing racing industry evolved since your time as a trainer? And what do you think are the most significant changes or challenges it faces today versus what you went through? Are you still actively involved in it? You know, those kind of questions. I left the business. I left the business in in 1984. Okay. Um, Well, in 1984, I got bought again for for life, but I won't, I won't get, I won't get into that. And then I was reinstated, reinstated about 10 years later. But I got back into the game, and uh, but it's it's like a, a guy coming out of jail, and spending ten years for for child molestation, and then trying to open up a, 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 a daycare. daycare. You know, it, 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 it ain't gonna happen. So I, I got plus the game changed to the point where if you didn't do what you had to do, which was all illegal, it, it wouldn't work. So I I I, I just got out, and then uh, I I and then the next. The next uh, uh, event was th- this this book, and okay. and I got lucky enough where when I wrote this book, and it's it's funny because the book they told me that when I write the book, uh, don't go more than eighty five thousand words, and I didn't know how much eighty five thousand words were, but I started counting them, 
And that, that's what 85,000 words is what we spoke around at, at breakfast one day. I was, was, was going to say, that's like an hour conversation right, for us. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't mind covering 20 years, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what's in the book is is one half of 1% of every chapter in the story, in, in right. the book. Plus all the good stuff is left out. I only put what's in there that could be verified because a lot of these stories are not believable to the average guy, especially to Hollywood people. But um, as soon as they got the book, um, they sent for me and I went down there and uh, and they they had, um, I don't know if you heard of Nicholas Pileggi. Nicholas Pileggi was the guy who wrote uh, Goodfellas and Casino. And oh, wow. he's the one that wrote that along with uh, Richard Price who wrote The Wire and uh, many of the best TV yes. series that are on television. Yes. And uh, and the actor uh, Ed Burns and and they were going to be the right writers to work with me to to create a, a movie or a TV series and after four or five meetings uh, and me talking um, what's in the book is just a tiny fraction of what what my whole life is right. and right. they uh, they were talking about. Um, they, they were trying to figure out it should it be a movie, a, a three, four hour movie or a TV series. And so I had contracts. They, they had the contracts made. I lawyered up and the, the lawyers spent three, four months writing, contra writing a contract. And they made two contracts, one for a movie. It was going to be a hundred million dollar budget of which I was going to get two and a half percent right up front, which was two and a half million dollars. And, and that, I was 82 at the time, and that's what I wanted. I just wanted to rough that money up real quick and then just end my life. You wanted, you wanted to go gamble it? Did you want to go gamble? No, just go to Vegas, get one of them $1,000 hookers every night. Just my life out like we didn't even get into all that, but we need to get into let's get into the Let's get into the meat and potatoes. Yes, yes. I was Come just on, Larry. Come on, there's just, you know, talk about the bad stuff. Yeah, so we went from the, the horse and the bedding. So when he said prostitute wine, and <laughs> <laughs> Joseph got all excited. I got I don't excited. Feel I got excited. What what exciting is the other part that your life is, you know, because we yeah. watch these movies like as young kids, Goodfellas, Casinos, and I'm from Chicago, and I've heard of the you know stories of the Al Capones and stuff like that, but. All I hear are stories, right? All I can well, see. And, and now we have Larry. We have, Larry, we have Larry in front of us. Tell us some some. Uh... So let's get to that part. Let no, me... Let, let, let me get something straight right now for you for your audience. I recognized when I was maybe 14, 15 years old. Okay. I I grew up in an area where the the not only that area, but the area I grew up with was Jackson Heights, Corona, Astoria, Regal Park. Mm -hmm. It was all like okay. blocks apart from one another, and and and. and not far from Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Yonkers, all completely mob infested. Okay. And naturally, you, you know, you see these guys with all the pinky rings and all the beautiful women and all the fancy cars. And so, when you're 14, 15, it, it's, it's very That was your impressive. inspiration. So that was yeah, your inspiration. But, uh, but I, I, I went that route for about a month. And after I got, and one, oh, night, one day after, after you, you, we used to fight all the time with the Irish gangs and everything. And my father and told the story. One day about I was that. sitting in the diner, all bloodied up with four or five of my friends, and everybody oh, was laughing. Yeah, you see, I cracked that guy's skull open and everything else. And here we are, our clothes ripped, full of blood. And this is a, a, a nightly affair. And I says, you know what? I, I says, I. I I, I don't want to do this. I, I don't get no kick out of hitting somebody in the head with a bat. I don't enjoy getting my nose broke and my, I just don't enjoy that. I enjoy okay. ca racing cars and music and girls. That's what I like. And this yeah, so is not it. So you were an educated point, wise I, guy. He was an educated I, I wise knew guy. I knew I wasn't going to go that route. He wanted money. Because I love music and because I wound up in a horse business, and I used to go to the nightclubs every single night. And the nightclubs are owned by, back then in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, every, there was a nightclub on every corner, and it was, it was a mob-owned nightclub on every corner. Okay. And uh, everybody from Frank Sinatra to, to me wound up getting involved with the mob one way or the other. And, and especially when they find out that you're in the horse business, everybody's looking for a tip or an edge. And you always wind up with a front table and no tab sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, but that was my only association with, with them guys. I knew them all. 
I know the stories, uh, and the, my only association with them was uh, that they owned the nightclubs that I frequent, and, and we had, with some of them, like John Gotti and one or two other ones, I had a horse with, and we did well together, and uh, and that kind of gave me carte blanche with, with, with a lot of the wise guys, but it was only, it wasn't my personality, it was because of the game that I was in, what I was able to what I was able to do, but that's as far as it, it, it went with them. And the same thing, uh, uh, Joseph, you said you were from Chicago. That's where, yes, uh, that's where Fra Frank Collada and Tony Spilatro were from. And, right. and, uh, and there were no two bigger mob guys than, than them in Vegas. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they did me, we worked together doing a lot of things. Never, never, uh, you know, um, some of the stories uh, I, I, everything that's in that book and everything I talk about, I right. got permission to talk about it. We understand. Of course. Of course. It was already in the newspaper, so it was already public domain. Gotcha. Uh, there's nothing I talk about that I didn't, because I'm not out to hurt anybody. Of course not. So. Uh, all I want to do is, uh, naturally, I'm trying to get to heaven, but uh, I'd also like to have a TV series or a movie. Before well, you want to also, die. you also want to live to watch the. <laughs> to watch the oh, that's what I mean. But, and, and, and what happened was uh, with, with with the with with the Pelleggi and them. Uh, Sony Pictures and Village Roadshow, they were going to put up the money to, to do the movie in 2019. And then we all went to California and then uh, COVID came. They shut down California for two years. Yeah. They called me up and they said they'd like to, uh, naturally, the, they, they bought the option to my life for 16 months. But that 16 months ran out because of COVID. When they called me up and they asked me, um, they said we'd like to resign you, and I and I said, well, can you get right back on the story? Because, you know, I'm not 40 years old. I'd like to. <laughs> and they said they couldn't promise that because they, um, you know, they, they they were in the process of making a lot of big movies with major stars that right. they had to shut down at the time. So I understood that, but I says, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna resign. But I re but I, I signed with. Uh, I signed with, uh, I didn't sign, uh, my, my friend, Tony Lip, one of the actors on The Soprano, I don't know if you ever heard of him, they, his two sons, Nicky and, and Frank, they wrote a screenplay about his, their father's life, who was my friend, and it was called The, the Green Book, um, and it was, they won the Academy Award about four or five years back, and they won all kinds of awards, it was a great, great movie, Green Book, and they read my book and they flew to New Jersey here and they were going to do my, 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 my movie. And, um, um, and, and, um, one day, uh, one of the brothers, Nick had to go back to California. We were already looking for locations and everything. Right. And one of the brothers, Nick had to go back to California. So Frank, he calls me up and he says, Larry, can, can I come back with you for a week? Because I don't want to stay in this room by myself. And uh, I said, sure, because when he c first came here, he came before his brother. He stayed with me for a couple of weeks, and we got along well. So I said, sure. So he 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 was supposed to come that Monday night. And Monday night, he never showed up. Tuesday, I called. No answer. Wednesday, no answer. Thursday, I got a call. And uh, they found him dead in the Bronx. Um, oh, Jesus. Uh, he, he picked up a hooker. He bought some co cocaine with, laced with uh, fentanyl. Oh, wow. And, uh, that was died. Back so in those days. Oh, they were dying back then. Yeah, because that's like and, a new uh, thing now. His brother, his brother told me at the repast that uh, he gave me his personal number. He says, I, I have to take time off, which is understandable. And um, he says, I'll get back in touch with you. Now, now, that was about four months ago. Now, since then, the writer, Barry O'Brien, the guy who writes for Law and Order, he read my book and he he sent for me, and he wants to do a TV series. Okay. So uh, we were all set to do the TV series, and we were going to fly out to California to start pitching this thing to all the streaming networks. And uh, that was the second week in, in uh, May. And then the, they had the writer's strike the day before I was supposed to fly out. And that ended that. That stopped that. So now that, that, that whole so thing now so now you're waiting, basically, for now them I'm to... I'm waiting, doing, doing the podcast, 
And okay. in the podcast, uh, you know, I, I, I tell what I tell. I leave a lot of stuff out. I'm hoping. As well, there's we a lot, to- Larry. You have a lot to talk about. You really do. And even having you on here with us, there's our minds, because we were talking about this before yeah. we got you in on on the camera. Yeah. And there's so much about you that um, we get tongue-tied and we can't think, right? We were like, there's so many stories. There's so many stories. You really do. And- yeah, you need. Yeah. You do need a series. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you quick also. Um, all right, so you're going to do this movie. Once everything gets ironed out, correct? Um, TV series. TV series. Um, now, have you thought about who you wanted to play your part to play you in the movie? That's a good question. No, we didn't get we didn't get to that point yet. I I, re- I really don't care. Yeah. I'm thinking of I'm, Leonardo I'm DiCaprio, good. maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I think would. Leonardo. No, like, Di- he would. I think Leonardo DiCaprio. Somebody, can you? You could tell them. Somebody that mentioned like, that. Somebody m- mentioned that. Uh, yeah. Oh God, God, he would. He would be because you know, and Larry was. An ex, ex, I mean, he's a handsome man today, but yes. Larry was a super, super handsome man. La- a ladies, a ladies man. Ladies um, man. Larry was, uh, wild man, and uh, <laughs> you know, Leonardo DiCaprio. I think he would like play the part. He definitely would. Oh yeah, especially in his. Um, somebody mentioned. Dream. Somebody mentioned him. Um, yeah, so. Well, that we're gonna tell them that's who has to do, and I think he would love to do the part actually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. So no more questions. We Come got on, thousands. I, I, I have I have one more question. I want because you know, when you when you talk about your life, um, Larry, it, it's so fascinating. And you know, and as you're talking, I'm trying to imagine like if I lived that life or like there's some things like I love music too, you know, I've done the nightclubs and you know, I've never really been around the people you've been around, but I have to ask because in one of your podcasts, you made a, a point that um, White Lee came in um, because uh, the guys were doing the books on on the side. You have mentioned like uh, like fear, right? Because you you deal with people that you obviously know are dangerous and they've done things, but the way you portray the conversation, your podcast, like you were like, it is what it is. Like, did you ever have a fear factor, or were you just such a adrenaline person where it just it never affected you that way like how did you how did you cope with that and knowing that dealing with that type of of circle that you could easily like dancing with the devil yeah like how how, yeah. how, did, how did you feel about that did you ever have like a scare moment a fear moment or were you just it is what it is you, you just kept skating. grinding oh i have a, well well to answer the question sure they were they, they it's 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 scary and most uh, w- would not survive the life that I, I lived, and it is and it is scary, but it becomes a way of life. It becomes uh, you know you learn real quick how to duck and dive. You know real quick what to say. You know real quick that you no matter what you better show up, no matter what, and uh, and that's what that's what kept me alive. What was I? Could- what, what was was the fear factor there? Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's always there, especially back in them years. You're yeah. dealing with scary, scary guys. I mean, one of the guys I was dealing with, Kabert, that guy killed 17 people. I, I mean, he was a, he was a serious Amazing. guy. So, and the so, guy I was dealing with him, little Sammy, he went to jail for murder. You know, while I was while I was dealing with them, they're serious, serious guys. And when they put me in that that little bucket of cement, that's what I was going to ask you about <laughs> the cement shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hear. When they put me in that little bucket of cement. And uh, he said, and Kabert come to my face, and uh, he says, now, we're, we're four or five miles out in the ocean. And he tells me, uh, he looks right, comes right to nose to nose. I'm standing in two feet of cement in a bucket. And he says to me, you tell me why I shouldn't let this cement harden and throw you the fuck overboard. Mm. Wow. That's a little scary, you know. So you escaped uh, death a lot, Larry. You really did. You danced with the uh, devil. You escaped a lot. Nine lives. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I guess you could say <laughs> that. But but what kept me alive was that the they knew I had the ability to earn. They knew how much money I lost prior. So it wasn't that I was just taking a shot at them. And uh, and even if I did, like I did, and I, I wound up losing seven eight hundred thousand dollars they knew that I had the ability to pay because of this the game I, I, I was in. Smart. And man. that's what kept me alive. And, so, and uh 
and so that would you say, well, you danced. You danced. So would you say they, view, mm-hmm. they so they definitely viewed you as an asset versus liability? Worth more than live than dead. If you were definitely a liability, you you would have probably went swimming. Yeah, if you weren't worth. Well, the o- the other thing too is that they <laughs> they got a million dollars from me, and you got to remember, uh, if if I borrow ten thousand dollars from you, right, and right. and I don't pay it back. You can get very, very mad at me because it was money you took out of your pocket to give to me. But if right. I make a bet with you for ten thousand and I lose the bet and I run away, you're not going to go chasing me because it wasn't no money out of your pocket. And that's the situation I had with them. I paid them over a million dollars, and then when I went broke, I took a shot at them, and that's when I lost the money. And then when I showed up and I says I don't have it. Uh, naturally, uh, th- because they were hardcore gangsters, their first thing is to kill you. But uh, when when he said to me, he said, uh, you tell me why I shouldn't let this cement harden and throw you the fuck overboard. My answer was, because I could pay. And he says, you wow. could pay? Good. I'm going to make this money a Shylock loan for two points. You come here every week and you pay. And if you miss one week, you'll be right back here. Wow. And 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 that's you know that's that's just one story. That's so, yeah, story. he was, um, yeah. Yeah. So so going to that real quick, just to finish up on that. So if if so if you don't come back one week, you're in the same spot. Does like that's like fear, living with fear. Like, how, but is so is that kind of like, it is what it is. You 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 swim. You yeah. Know what, what you and, do. and that's what that's what um, part of the book is about. Part of what my life is about because. That was right around 1972. And for um, maybe four or five years, I, I paid every every week. Wow. And, 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 and part of the story, probably the guts of the story, was um, how I made this money to pay. I mean, mm-hmm. you try to make 16000 a week, plus live your life, plus pay your rent. Did you want, do, you, do you want to just give us an example on how you made that money? Yeah, fixed races. Yeah. <laughs> there you have it. He knows best, right? Oh, wait, wait. Guys, you, I, I, yeah. I did the math here, right? Yeah. So you were saying that you were... <laughs> I, I wanted him to say that. <laughs> okay, so he was saying earlier that he was paying $7,500 a week, right, in 1971. Right. Guess how much that money is today. How much? Hey, guess. Well, I don't know what it is today, but I, I'll tell you how I how I uh, how I I half got out of it. After uh, I think three years or four years, um, things were getting really really tough, and I went to both of them, Cabert and, and Mark Barney, uh, and I told them I says, "Look, my earning potential is not what it used to be. I'm going to wind up in trouble. Before mm. I wind up in trouble, and you guys get mad." I paid you in VIG alone twice as much as, as what I owe you. So why don't we make a deal now that I could live up to and stop the VIG and whatever money I give you come off the top? Okay. And that's and, th- and they made that deal because they, they knew. I went to them. You can't run from these guys. You got to you gotta go take your right. lumps. I, I did the wrong and thing. I took a face. shot at them. And you did take some lumps, Larry. Oh, I took some lumps. I took some lumps from the time I was from the time I was born. Thought with my mother. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things I can. Re- I remember growing up and hearing things about Larry. So, seventy five hundred dollars yeah. in 1971 today is around fifty six thousand dollars. Wow. That's so that's crazy. how much you're paying a week. Wow. That's crazy. Well, I always said sometimes I I, I sit when I'm having dinner with some of my friends and and. Uh, Sometimes that things are not going too well, and I said, you know, if there was just one weekend that I didn't bet, I'd yeah. have a half a million dollars. Wow. You know, just one weekend, not not the whole year, just one weekend, just because I bet I bet twenty thousand a game with each guy, with Barney and with Cabert. So every football game, especially the football season, I can talk about the most because that's when I really stretched out. And they have like sixteen games for the for the season, and you know, you're betting forty thousand a game. You're betting ten, uh, ten, eleven games a, a week. You know, so j- just figure that, just f- figure that out. You're, you're talking about betting four hundred thousand dollars just every every weekend, and if you lose every game, 
I mean, you know, it, it's it's tough. And then and then there was a period of time when I was betting 100, 101 college games. My limit for them was uh, five hundred dollars a game, but I've betting 100, 101 college games. I stopped that after about a month because it was a pain in the ass. See, I could never find out if I, yeah. was, you know, it was just it was just too tough. I was too busy. So you were doing a lot. You were just betting on everything. I, I was I was doing mm. a lot. Um, also, again, we, we can be all over the place. You also did something with a, um, a I want to say, a cure for cancer. Because I was reading that in the book. How, what was your involvement? Do you mind putting a little bit on that? that or do, that, you, do you want to? Yeah, that, uh, what, what, I, I was partners on, on a, well, I wasn't partners. Very early on, uh, in the early 70s, um, uh, uh, Davey Handel, who was a, a horse owner, um, he was going to go to jail for income tax evasion mm. and he sold all his horses and he only had one horse left. And I had just arrived at Monticello and he had one horse left that he didn't want to sell because the horse's name was Mary Martha. It was named after his wife oh, wow. who died and he didn't want to get rid of that horse. So he says, Larry, I'm going to go away probably for three, four years. He says, would you take this horse and get, so I did, I took the horse. Now, now during that time, when he got out, um, Naturally, I had the horse back down all the way down in, in class, and we raced the horse the first night, the first week he was out, and we bet a lot of money on him, and, and he won, and he was happy, and, and we gave him maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, got him a suite with a hooker in there, and he was very happy. <laughs> and then he came to me, and he said, listen, I have a good friend of mine, Dr. Lawrence Burton, who developed a cure for cancer. I'll go through this real quick. And I'll, I'll get, yeah, but it was so amazing. What, I wanted to, you're like oh. a Robin Hood. Yeah. <laughs> Larry's Robin Hood. So what, what happened was uh, he found a cure for cancer. And how he found it was, and he was one of thousands that the Cancer Society and, and all them cancer organizations had working all over the United States to find a cure for cancer. So what he did and how he did it was um, he was... Uh, he found two identical twins, identical DNA and everything else. But one, strangely enough, had cancer. The other one didn't. He extracted the blood from both of them. And he found out that the one that didn't have cancer had a property, a protein in the blood that wasn't in the other one. He extracted that protein. He injected it into a malignant tumor. The tumor disappeared. That was the cure. When he went to the bone Kettering and all the people that he was dealing with, uh, they asked for uh, how he did it and everything else. And he says, I will give you all my paperwork, but I want to head this thing because in my experience working here, there were a lot of promising things that many doctors came up with, scientists came up with that you buried in an effort to make bigger profits. Isn't that crazy? So uh, that is, they fired him. When they fired him, me and, me and Dave, um, we bought him a house in Long Island, bought him all the best equipment he could get. And uh, eventually made a deal with the Bahamian government to bring him down there, build him a clinic, and split 50-50 uh, whatever he made. Wow. And that was a deal we made. Right after we got him to the Bahamas, I got a phone call from my cousin, uh, husband, and, and uh, it was uh, Tony. And, and uh, they said that your cousin Cookie, who was married to, was given three months to live. She has terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. I called up Dr. Burton, sent her down there. She stayed there for six weeks and uh, completely cured. Since then, I must have sent 100, 150 people down there, all cured and everything else. Wow. And, amazing. And that, Isn't this amazing? That's, the, that is. that's why I like we had to worry about that. Amazing. Wow. That's why I said Larry's like a Robin Hood. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. And now where is that study? Where is all that today? Yeah. They just... Oh, the, the clinic is still there. Dr. Burton, Dr. Burton died of old age, but the oh, clinic wow. is still there. It's being run by Dr. Clements. And uh, and the, the treatment is simple. It's no chemotherapy, no nothing. It's uh, it, it's uh, it just builds up your the body's own immune system. And uh, you get a shot in the morning, a shot at night. He monitors your blood every day. And as your cancer is decreasing, the, 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 the treatments become less and less. And by six six weeks uh most of the time it's completely gone and you're completely cured the whole thing back then was uh between the plane fare the hotel and everything else uh was ten thousand dollars um not so he didn't take insurance and it was all cash 
And uh, once my cousin Cookie went there and got cured, I must have got uh, 50 calls a day uh, saying that, could you please help me and everything else. And some of them, they had no money. And, and, and that was another thing. In the middle of me paying this 15000 60000 a week in VIG, I was sending down maybe five, six families every week and paying paying that nut. Amazing. And had it not yeah, been see, for the, you know, uh, how I was able to juggle the money, I had a three-state kite going. And thankfully, mm-hmm. Charles Slutsky on the racetrack let me cash a check up anything up to $50,000. And he just told me, make sure it don't bounce. He knew I was kiting a check. So I would cash a check from... Uh, New Jersey for, for 30000 at the racetrack, and then I had 10 days to juggle, and if I didn't, I cash another check from the Delaware account, and it was just it's just cash flow. I needed, if, if you have cash flow like yeah. that, you could be completely broke but live like a millionaire. Yep. Right. Just cash flow. And, that, and that's what happened. In fact, I don't know if you remember, you were too young. The church in Monticello burnt down, and when the church in Monticello burnt down, it was the only church there. Down yeah. right on Main Street, and um, he, the priest came to the racetrack, and Slutsky came into the paddock with him and asked for donations. Mm. And uh, I, they, they, I, I says, Charles, so we'll get, take it out of the purse money. And he says, Nah. He said, Wouldn't be fair. So he says, Well, why don't you uh, and me put up a uh, hundred thousand each and, and give it to him? He was about a hundred and eighty thousand short. So that's what I did. At that time, I was wow. able to do it. I said, as wow. long as you keep did the, a, did the a lot. going. Larry did a lot. So, yeah. so what happened is he, they rebuilt the church. And then what happened, I don't know if you know this girl. Her name was Lynn. She was, a, she was around your age. She had a kid. And my mother used to babysit for this little baby. And she wanted to get the kid christened. She wanted me to be the godfather. So I said, I said, okay. So now... She goes to the church. It was the only church in Monticello. Right. She goes to the church and she tells the priest, I want to have this. And he wouldn't do it because she wasn't married. It was a child out of wedlock. So she comes back and crying and everything. And my mother, my oh, let's not get on that. Yeah. Oh. My it's mother sends for me and she tells me the story. So I went to the church and I told the priest, I says, listen, is it that girl that you came to have the kid? And he says, yeah, we're, I says, fuck you and your man-made rules. You don't call her up and give her an appointment. Uh, I'll burn this fucking church down. I built it, I'll burn it down. <laughs> he called up and gave her the appointment. <laughs> and the kid was Chris. Wow. I'm sorry, Larry, but that sounds funny. So you yeah, want to burn was, the fucking church down. <laughs> I'll bring it down. Oh, my God. But it's it rightfully so. Yeah. I mean, everything you've done and everything, you know, it's just. Well, it's not even everything rules. you did. It's just the rules. Those the rules, rules are just. Wow. Crazy. That's the one thing wow. I have against religion. It's just the the man made rules that they, yeah. you know, it's it's just I, I don't know. So you've done a lot of, a lot of good things, Larry. You know, you may all right. So you you maybe done some things that you were maybe not approval of society or, or, me, or, or the way of life or life of life. But that's you've done you, a lot a lot of good things. So in other words, I'm going to be the vindicator. You're going to be going to heaven when when the time comes. <laughs> Absolutely. You're going to heaven because you've done. You were like this, right? You're on, he's on the spectrum of up and down, just yeah. like you know. And it's like, like yeah. look at Robin Hood. If you look, right. at I said, I said Robin Hood. Hood. It's you know, you stole every, from the rich, gave to the poor. No, you've done a lot. Wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've done a lot, a lot of good too. So it's all going to weigh out. So when you get up there, you you know, you won't have to uh, wait so long at the gate. <laughs> Larry, I got a question for you. Is is was Ellie's dad in the mob? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Phil, don't be talking no shit. I'll go in there and break your kneecaps. <laughs> oh, no. I'm kind of scared right now. Are you in the mob now? <laughs> Ellie? Wait, I did threaten him a few times. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you this, but I won't get into that kind of stuff. But I will tell you this. Frank oh, Lacasio, who was John Gotti's underboss. I know him. Farm, I remember him. Bought a farm right around Goshen. Yeah. And 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 because of uh, uh, Ali, which is Ellie's father, and and, uh, and Joe, they had to ship horses back and forth and everything, and they became friendly. When Frank and John Gotti and Frank Lacasio went to jail because uh, Sammy de Bulgravano become a government witness, mm-hmm. uh, y- your uncle Joe 
uh, used to go visit him all the time. Wow. They both did. I remember. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Wait, now they're going to start questioning me. But I have, <laughs> I have a story. We have stories. I see that. But yeah, they used to go up and visit him all the time. Up until I would say, well, Frank died. He passed away about two years ago, I think, Frank Lacasio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Um, my, my dad and uncle were going up all the time to visit him. Yeah. 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 So anything, I, so Joseph, just so yes, you sir. know. Yes, sir. Anything you want to ask me, anything about the mob, about race fixing, about race curing, or about training, about anything you want in life, you just ask me. That's why I said anything you want to ask me about about, about anything. You okay. Ask me about the, the first girl I ever kissed or <laughs> whatever. It, it makes no difference. I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer anything. I, th I I think we're going to have to have another podcast yeah, with absolutely. Larry. Um, and, you know, the more familiar we get with the yeah, stories, because we have some, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories um, that we can be discussing and talking about. I mean, I remember meeting one of Larry's uh, Shylocks when I was about 14 years old. Really? He bought me my first drink in a, in a bar at 14 wow. where's larry where's larry go? <laughs> 14 <laughs> i told larry the story my i have older sisters and there was a bar and where, where i'm from and uh -huh. uh, where I was in, the, in the racetrack and i could remember going in there and my first drink was a rum and coke rum and coke and um i was with my family actually so. and i remember them saying that he was larry's shylock and i didn't understand what that was. i'm like what does that mean wow. so yeah it's funny when you think about how it comes together yeah 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 i didn't know i mean a lot of the stuff i didn't know until later in life that's crazy but yeah larry you got so a lot now of stories. you know that if you had me on every day for 10 years you'd still never run out of stories I'm sure. no I'm, i yeah that's why we can we can talk for <laughs> forever yeah absolutely uh it's good though i mean you did a lot of good stuff too yeah <laughs> All right, Larry. Um, tell everybody where they can find your book again, and um, give well, us your the website. Book only, the book, the book can be only bought on Amazon. Amazon, and yeah. uh, just ask for "Against All Odds" by Larry Rolla. And uh, I, 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 um, if you want to watch the podcast, just go to um, uh, YouTube and punch in Larry Rolla. That's it. Yep. And if you want to go to my website. Uh, it's I think it's uh, LarryRoller.com. Larry yeah, we just posted it on the screen yeah. as well. Yeah. So uh, if you if you like the, these kind of stories, um, just go to the web the the podcast. You'll you'll hear them all. That podcast will probably go on forever because uh, I did I think I did four four or five four ad already. I have another four that I already did. I think we're going to add you to some of ours as well. Yeah, absolutely. And. and and there's so much I left out of each one that I have to I have to go I have to go back, uh, you know, and say before we go any further, there's so much I left out of three podcasts ago and try to fill in the blanks. But I'm hoping that some people would write in, send in the email uh, questions asking, just like Joseph did, you know, uh, help me fill in the blanks because I'll just r ramble on and miss so much yes but if somebody stops me and say whoa 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 you said this and this and that. how'd you do that that's yeah. what i need well that's I well that's why we wanted joseph to come on as well <laughs> but um yeah we could actually we should do another podcast where we have yeah. callers we could have callers that call in nice. yeah I yeah mean, we can get would. some people to you, um, it's just in. you know you, you're a very interesting person larry and you know we're all different we're all unique and we're all different but you know when you you have history of things that you know mm -hmm. people see in movies and to actually i mean to, to for me to know ellie and and you you guys know each other you know her father it's just i mean to me i'm kind of mind blown over here because just so many stories that you have that we can hit a lot <laughs> so many questions that i want to dive into but it definitely could be a to be continued on this one yeah i think we're going to have to do this another time and get uh and yeah well, we should do some call-ins anytime you just you got my number ellie i just, do i got you larry me. The, you're an amazing I, man I, yeah you are i think i figured out how to get this on the computer now i got <laughs> well yesterday camera. yesterday we had a trial run real quick did you That's and he did is. good he did good he got right in there I'm like oh this is there he is yeah it's all good stuff larry you're an amazing man we hope we get you back on the podcast again yes, sir. story time with ellie and i want to thank you 
again for being a guest. And it was a pleasure. Um, that you got that does the camera and the voice. He's a pretty sharp guy. He come he come up with a couple of good questions. He should he should ask he should ask more questions. Yes, he should, and he would, but he's been in it for 25 years. <laughs> hey, Larry, Next time, we're going to bring Phil back out. Hey, Larry, uh, I just want to uh, let you know that it was an absolute pleasure meeting you, and yeah. thank you for sharing your story, and I can't wait to talk soon, man. It should be story time well, with I'm, Phil. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> story time I'm with glad Phil. Ellie, Ellie got in touch with me because it's so nice seeing her. It was uh, good after. seeing you, too. Yeah. Handsome Larry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Larry, take care. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Larry. Bye. -bye.